Uh, it's not an allegory. A lot of people have used some of these words to describe parables. I don't think parables are any of those things. Uh, they're just they're illustrations that Jesus used to take that which man was very familiar with and to draw a spiritual lesson out of it so that they could grab a greater truth than perhaps they understood to begin with. But because they understood that story, something that was real in life, uh, an allegory or a fable, they don't have to be real. You know, you, you, can have, uh, you can have trees talking, you can have vegetables talking, you know, you can have whatever, you know, walking around and doing things that really don't walk around and talk, but that's, that's what a fable or an allegory will allow you to have to tell a story. Jesus didn't tell stories like that. Jesus told stories that, that were real to life. There's not a single parable that Jesus told that could not have really happened or may not have really happened. And that he was basing uh, a story that may have happened or at least could have happened and taking that uh, and bringing in that moral thought, uh, that greater truth that he was trying to teach. And then we noticed last week that it's important for us to study the parables because that was uh, at least a third of what Jesus taught and how he taught was using parables. And then we looked, and I'm trying to review some of this just briefly. Uh, some of you were not here last week. Just in looking at the purpose of Jesus using parables, and that's in Matthew chapter 13 is where we get a lot of this information because the, the apostles came to him and they asked him in Matthew chapter 13 and verse 10, why are you teaching to them in parables? And Jesus tells us why he's teaching in parables. And there's two primary reasons. Sometimes people put this as the primary reason, uh, to conceal the truth. I don't necessarily put that as the primary reason. I'll put this as the primary reason and the concealing as the secondary reason. Primary reason Jesus used parables, I believe, is so that he could reveal spiritual truth to those people who were seeking it. When Jesus started teaching in parables, he didn't teach in parables uh, for about the first year of his ministry. But in that second year, he starts teaching in parables. And we mentioned last week, probably right about the same time that all of this opposition started coming against him. Jesus taught in parables so that those who really wanted to find the truth and find the will of God, they could find it. You know, it, we, we read over and over in the New Testament, Jesus saying something like, he who, has e he who has ears to hear, let him hear. And when you first read that, or somebody who doesn't understand uh, Jesus' uh, teaching style reads that and says, okay, so does that mean deaf people are without hope? You know, what, what does that mean? If you don't have ears, are you lost? What does it mean, he who has ears to hear, let him hear? He who has ears who wants to hear. There were people in Jesus' day, we looked at this, Matthew chapter 13, uh, to verses uh, 15, 14 and 15, where Jesus, quoting from Isaiah, talked about those who had eyes, but they couldn't see. They had ears, but they couldn't hear. Why? Because they chose not to. They chose to, to, to stop their eyes. They chose to stop up their ears. Jesus taught in parables because if somebody wanted to find the truth, think, think about the parable of the Good Samaritan. If you want to find truth, if you want to know the will of God, could you find it by hearing the, the, the parable of the Good Samaritan? If you want to know the will of God, you learn who your neighbor is and how you need to serve your neighbor. If you hear the, uh, the parable of, uh, of the ten virgins... Five wise and five foolish virgins. If you're looking for the will of God, could you find it in hearing that parable? The parable of the Pharisee and the publican, the two men who are praying in the temple. If you wanted to find the will of God, could you find it? Yeah, Jesus taught dozens of parables. Most of the time, simple stories that the meaning should have been understood. And those people who were looking for truth could find it. But at the same time, he was teaching in parables to conceal the truth from those who did not want to find it. Those people who were not looking for the truth, who were, had their eyes stopped up and their ears stopped up and their hearts stopped up, Jesus taught in parables and they didn't have a clue what he was talking about. They could not grasp that truth that he was teaching uh, because they didn't want to know that truth. Jesus taught in parables to uh, try to get men to assent to truth, to agree to a truth, before they even realized what they were agreeing to. 
Get people nodding their heads saying, yep, that's right, yep, that's right, yep, he, he's got a point there, he's got a point there. Before he pointed the finger at them and said, oh, by the way, that's you. And he did that on occasion. Where parables were talking about the people who were listening to him, but they didn't even realize that he was talking about them. And we talked about that parable that Nathan told to David, and David didn't even realize it was talking about him until Nathan pointed the finger. Uh, and that's, that's one of the purposes in using parables uh, is to get people to see a point before they actually get the point. Uh, he told parables to fulfill Old Testament prophecy uh, because the Old Testament prophesied in Psalm 78 that he would come and that he would speak in parables. If Jesus did not teach in parables, he could not have been the Messiah. He could have fulfilled all of the other prophecies about the coming Messiah, but if he didn't speak in parables... He didn't fulfill all of them. And then he taught in parables because there's a, lot of, uh, there's a lot of advantages that resulted from speaking in this type of thing. Uh, he spoke about situations that they understood. You know, if Jesus had come and he taught in parables, but he talked to them about rocket ships, would that have been effective? Probably not. If he had come to them and still kept things true to life, but used but talked about computers or talked about DVD players. Would there be a little bit of confusion that would be created? It's created even amongst us. You start talking about computers and DVD players today, and some people are like, what are you talking I don't know. I don't know anything about that. Uh, he used and talked about things that they were very familiar with to draw these points. And then the last point we made as the bell was ringing last week is that Jesus talked, taught, taught in parables so that people would remember it that they would know and be able to remember long after he ever told the story, be able to remember that story. How many of us cannot, because we have heard the story and perhaps heard it over and over, not tell the story about the sower? We might not remember all the details and sometimes we might trip over, you know, what the four different soils were, but do we know that story basically? Could we basically tell the story and remember what the point was of the story? How many of us could, couldn't tell the story about the... Uh, about the, uh, ta- the men of the talents, with the, with the, with the uh, master passing out his talents before he left town and the result when, when he came back. Do we not know that story? You know, how many of us couldn't tell the story? And you pick one of the parables. How many of us don't know some of these stories? They're familiar to us. And think about it. These folks, they didn't have the parables written down in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. They didn't have them. You know, it wasn't that Jesus told them and then the next week they could go down to the bookstore and pick up the latest copy of, you know, Jesus' teachings and have it right there to carry with them. (coughs) They needed something that was easy to remember so that they could turn around and teach it to others. And that's what parables are. Something that are, stories that are easy to remember. Let's talk about studying. And we didn't get to this last week. How do you study? How do you come to the parables? How are you supposed to interpret the parables? And uh, I don't want to spend a lot of time here um, but I spend some time here because, unfortunately, some people have uh, taken the parables. And uh, I, I put these first two extremes to avoid here at the beginning because some people have gone to extremes with the parables. They've gone to some extremes where they try to find some spiritual truth in every little detail of the parable. And that's not intended to be. Uh, I, I read last week about uh, one bishop who who found, a, in his mind, a meaning for every little detail of the parable of the Good Samaritan. He found what Jerusalem was stood for and what Jericho stood for and what the priest stood for and what the, what the robbers stood for. I mean, he found a meaning for everything in that parable. I'm not sure where he found it. I mean, you, you read Luke chapter 10 and there's not that many meanings associated, right? Where does he find them? Oh, he's just making them up. Well, if he's got a right to make up what every little detail means, I've got a right to make up what every little detail means, right? And my little details could be different than his little details. And if I make up what every little detail means, all of a sudden I can say, okay, here's what this detail stands for. And then I could preach to people and say, you need to go do this because this detail of this parable says that you ought to do this. David, that's tricky. Yeah. Take up much of your time, but I saw the real Good Samaritan today. She came into the office. For the sh- to buy the share of food. She had two things filled out, one for herself and one for a friend. It happens to be a neighbor of hers who is sick, who can't work and has no family. And the last time she carried food to her, 
the lady said, why are you doing this? You don't even know me. Mm -hmm. And she says, you're my neighbor mm -hmm. and you're hurting. So I'm helping. She just put in another order today of food from Share Food to take. To me, that's good yeah. Samaritan. Yeah, and that's, that, what is that? You know, Jesus said, who, who is my neighbor? Well, it's not, in this case, it is the lady's neighbor. But we've got, no, we've got more than just that next door neighbor. And it's not, wait, it's not waiting for them to ask for a need. You know, they there, there was the man beaten up on the road. Was, was he asking people to help him? Doesn't say that he was. But, you know, you see somebody in that condition, and while their mouth might not say, help me, something else is saying, help me. And, and this, this may have been the same woman who called the office yesterday and was talking about the fact that, yes, she was ordering food out of the SHARE program, but she was also ordering food for her neighbor, and uh, she was just giving it to her neighbor, you know, it, uh, some people are ordering for their neighbors, but they're taking money for their neighbors and just bringing the orders here. This lady's ordering, you know, she's saving the money on the food, and so she's buying it for somebody else. And that's seeing a need, not waiting to be asked. Uh, but that was the purpose. That was the primary point that Jesus was making in that parable. If you stretch it to try to find meaning in every little detail, guess what you miss? You miss the point. You try to find meaning in everything else and you totally miss the point that Jesus was making because you're trying to make your own points. We need to be careful with that in the parables. And then the other, the other thing is to, is to come to a parable and say, well, there's only one truth in this parable. I'm going to find it. I'm going to ignore anything, any other truths that come out of it. For the most part, there is one truth. There's one primary point that Jesus is making in a parable. But that doesn't mean that there's not some, some secondary points that he's also making at the same time. So we, there's two extremes to avoid what we need to do is to allow Jesus to make the points. To allow Jesus to show us uh, where the emphases need to be placed. Let me just very quickly give three keys to studying the parables. And as we go through these, these qu this quarter, uh, these are the three areas that I'm going to try to break our studies into uh, for every parable when we come to the study. First is, when you study a parable, try to figure out what's the historical background to this parable. Look in Luke chapter 15. Luke chapter 15 has three parables in it. Anybody know what they are? Prodigal son. Yes, prodigal son is one. So you got the lost boy at the end of it. And if I say lost boy, hopefully that helps you with the other two. What else do you have lost in Luke 15? Lost coin. Lost sheep. Oh, widow and his judge is uh, three chapters later. That's a good one too. We're going to look at that one. You're in Luke 8. You're skipping ahead, Freddie. Luke 18 is the bottom one. We're going to look at Luke 15 first. All right, Freddie's one of these advanced learners. He jumps ahead. Luke 15. When you're looking at the parables, before you actually look at the parable itself, you need to try to figure out why is Jesus telling the parable? What, is there any historical background? Is there anything happening in the verses before or after the parable that might give us some insight into why Jesus is telling these parables. He tells in Luke 15, parable of the lost sheep, parable of the lost coin, parable of the lost son, as my Bible says it, the prodigal son. Look in Luke 15, first two verses. Then all the tax collectors and the sinners drew near to Jesus to hear him. And the Pharisees and scribes complained, saying, this man receives sinners and eats with them. What's the first word you've got in verse 3? So, or and. They were complaining, this guy's receiving sinners. So what does Jesus turn around and do? Tells these three parables. What's the point of these parables? The point of the parables is that Jesus is answering these people who are complaining about him receiving sinners. If, remember, uh, uh, well, maybe an easier verse, Matthew chapter 1 and verse 21, where it was announced that Jesus would, or he would be called Jesus saying that his name should be Jesus, for he will save what? His people from what? Sins. Their sins. Why did Jesus come? Seeking to save that which was lost? Save people from their sins? Who would you expect Jesus to be hanging out with? It's interesting. These uh, Pharisees and scribes apparently weren't turning that mirror towards themselves. They just had it turned outward and they saw all these, these scummy tax collectors that they didn't want to have anything to do with because they were taking their taxes from them. You know, sometimes the way, same way we see the IRS, they don't deserve, you know, uh, 
uh, to uh, have the same opportunities as us, right? Because they're taking all of our money. So I'm not going to try to teach them the gospel because, you know, those are just lousy people taking my money. And it, even worse with these tax collectors in Jesus' time, these are Jews working for the Romans taking my money. I don't want to have anything to do with them. And Jesus tells these parables to say, guys, huh, we need to watch out for those who are lost. And what do we need to do when we find those who are lost? We need to rejoice that they've come. And that's the reason. So there's this story. Flip over a couple pages to Luke chapter, uh, Luke chapter 18. Jesus has been uh, talking about the fact that uh, uh, he's going to be leaving. And uh, he says in Luke chapter 18, he spoke a parable to them that men always ought to pray and not lose heart. And so he tells at least two parables here about praying. Here were, here were guys who, per, who were perhaps losing heart because Jesus was getting ready to leave. So what does he talk to them about? Prayer. Talks to them about the opportunity uh, to, to pray. And when you have that, that first parable in Luke chapter 18 about the persistent widow, what does that teach us about prayer? Keep pray without ceasing. You got the parable about the Pharisee and the tax collector. What does that teach us about prayer? Have the proper attitude in our prayers. And uh, so there's, there is some historical background for many of the parables. You might have a hard time figuring it out on some. But before you even read a parable, try to figure out what's happening when Jesus is telling this parable. Jesus, Jesus didn't just wake up one morning and say, well, you know, I'll just go teach this parable. It has nothing to do with what's happening today. But, you know, I just I thought about this overnight. There's a reason that Jesus was teaching these parables for these people to learn these lessons from. First thing we ought to do is try to figure out what's that historical background. Second thing we ought to do is, guess what? Read the parable. Uh, before you go to any commentaries, before you pick up any books to say, okay, I'm fixing to read uh, the, the uh, parable of the, uh, of the unforgiving servant. Uh, before I read that, I think I'll go and read what brother so-and-so says about it so that I've got a better idea of what it says before I read it. Forget that. Just go and read what Jesus says. Read the parable through and the first time through, just, just give it a quick read through so that you get an idea of what the parable is. Get an idea of what, what's happening in the parable and then go back through and take a slower look at it. Read through, looking at the details, looking at the points that Jesus is making, not to try to find meaning in everything, but you know what's the point of sowing seed? What has that got to do with anything? Does that have anything to do with me? This idea of the, the, the imagery of sowing seed. There may be some extra background you need to figure out. Might be some cultural things that might be helpful to understand. See, we, we don't understand Matthew 25 and the marriage feast and these, and these, uh, these virgins being out there waiting for, the, waiting for the bridegroom to come. We don't, that's so foreign to us. And so we, we try to assign perhaps what we think it might mean. But there's an opportunity to go back and do some study on, you know, how, what was happening in those days with these marriage customs uh, and these marriage feasts so that we can have a better understanding uh, of that particular parable. And then I was always try to figure out, you know, what is there any grammatical uh, significance to what Jesus is saying? But first, figure out the historical background. Second, read through the parable and gain an understanding of it yourself. Again, these are stories that that most of them are not difficult to understand. He doesn't use complex words or, uh, uh, or anything like that. And, and then finally, we need to find the primary lesson. What's the main thing that I ought to draw from this? And a lot of times it's, it's very obvious. A lot of times Jesus is going to point it out for you. And if he doesn't point it out for you, when you read that parable of the, uh, uh, pick a parable of the Pharisee and the publican, that's pretty obvious. Uh, and I think even Jesus in Luke chapter 18 uh, actually gives uh, the purpose of, of telling that parable and what the main point is. But ordinarily, a parable is designed to teach one primary truth. Try to find that primary truth. You know, the parable of the ten virgins, Jesus says in verse 13 of Matthew 25, therefore watch. Well, that's, that's, that's the main point. And I, and I need to find that main point and apply it to myself. Sometimes there are those supplementary truths that are embodied there, but here's what I've got to be cautious of is to not take some point out of a parable that would be inconsistent with its main point. And that happens a lot. You know, so there's, some, uh, there's some folks who, who want to take one little piece of a parable and build a whole doctrine out of that one little piece of a parable. 
When the one little piece of a parable, it's just a piece. It's just a, a detail that has no, no particular meaning, but they, fi they find what they think is, is, is what, exactly what they need. For instance, the, the parable of, of the wheat and the tares. Who knows the parable of the wheat and the tares? Man went out, sowed seed. What happened? We got wheat growing, right? Then what happens? Enemies, Enemies come in. They sow, and now we've got tares growing with the wheat. And what did Jesus say about, about that? Should they run in and grab the tares and pull them out immediately? No. Let them grow together. And then in the end, why, well, why don't you go grab them out immediately? Here, pull up all the roots. You let them grow together, and then at the end of the, at, at harvest time, then you go and pull them all out and you separate them. There's some who've come to that and they've said, well, there's Jesus teaching that we don't need to, uh, to withdraw fellowship from anyone because Jesus says, let them grow together. That's not the point of that parable at all. And that's taking one little piece that, that, that Jesus is not making a point about and trying to make a point where does that not contradict other clear biblical teaching elsewhere in Scripture? That's a hard thing to do. There have been parables where they'll, they'll pick a point and, uh, you know, they, they build a doctrine of once saved, always saved, based upon one point in, in a parable. But does that, does that jive with the rest of Scripture? No. It's interesting how they'll want to pull something out of a parable and then they're okay with that contradicting what something else says in Scripture because they've got Jesus saying it. Are the red letters in your Bible, are they more meaningful are they more infallible than the black letters in your Bible? Shake your head this way. All of the words in your Bible are red. If you want a red-lettered Bible, meaning these are the words of Jesus, then get somebody to print you every word in your Bible in red. Because they're all from the Lord, aren't they? If it's Jesus walking on the earth and speaking them, is that different than God inspiring Moses to write them? No. In fact, in John chapter 12, verse 48 is where Jesus says, He rejects me and receives not my words, has that which judges him. The words that I have spoken will judge him in the last day. You know what Jesus goes on in the next two verses to say about his words? They're not his. Jesus says, my words are going to judge you. But he says in verse 49, I have not spoken on my own authority, but my Father who sent me has given me these words, what I should say and what I should speak. The red letters in your Bible are no different than the black letters. They all come from the Lord. And so just because Jesus said something, oh, well, this is different than what Paul said. Where did Paul get his words? 1 Corinthians chapter 14, and verse 37, If any man be spiritual or prophet, let, let him acknowledge that the things that I write unto you are the words of the Lord. They're not mine. They're the commandments of God. Holy men of God spoke as they were moved by yeah. the Holy Spirit. 2 Peter chapter 1, and verse 21, Holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. And so it have got to be careful about trying to, to pit Jesus uh, against other Bible writers. And, and it's not just the parables. You know, you get into a study of marriage and divorce and remarriage and people will pit Paul and Jesus against each other all the time. Uh, you know, I don't understand that. I don't understand, well, Jesus said this or Paul said, folks, it's all the same. They were getting their words from the exact same source. Same in the Old Testament. What did, Je what did uh, uh, he's got a good, David, <laughs> Can't remember that guy's name. What did David say about the word of the Lord? Where was it? The word of the Lord was on my tongue. Was David deciding what words to speak? No, they were put there. And that's, that, that's God uh, giving us an understanding. Let, let's talk. Wow, I've got 10 minutes to do this. I think I've got about 20 slides on this. Very quickly. If you had to assign a general theme... Jesus told 30-something parables. If you had to assign a general theme to all of the parables, what would you say it is? Well, I'll give you my answer. The kingdom of heaven. If you want a summary of Jesus' parables, and here's what I think is interesting. Jesus, we've already said, a third of what Jesus taught, he taught in parables. Parables. 
There's been a lot of teaching and a lot of ideas about what the kingdom is, a lot of misunderstandings. There's been those who have taught that Jesus intended to come and to establish his kingdom on the earth, but the Jews rejected him, so he tucked that plan away. He'll do that later. He established the church instead. He left the earth, and when he comes back at the end of time, he'll come to earth, reign a thousand years, establish his earthly kingdom, and uh, sit on an earthly throne in Jerusalem and reign for a thousand years. If that's true, why would he waste a third of his time talking about a kingdom that never was going to happen in those people's lifetime? And if that's true, and if he's God, wouldn't he have an inkling of an idea that these people aren't going to accept the kingdom? So why waste my time even talking about it now? When Jesus came, Jesus spent an incredible amount of time talking about the kingdom. I believe the kingdom of heaven was the very theme of his entire ministry. And we're going to look at this in just a minute. The very theme of the Sermon on the Mount, we'll look at that, is about the kingdom. And I think the, the theme of the parables is the kingdom of heaven. Look very quickly. We're, we're just going to have to fly through this, so I apologize for this. The theme of Jesus' ministry was the kingdom of heaven. And some of these verses I've intentionally paired up here. Matthew chapter 4 and verse 17, Jesus preached, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. What's the difference between the kingdom of heaven in Matthew 4 and verse 17? and Jesus coming and preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and preaching instead of the kingdom of heaven, he preached the kingdom of God is at hand. What's the difference between the kingdom of heaven is at hand and the kingdom of God is at hand? Any difference? It's the exact same thing. So why would Jesus use different words? This phrase, the kingdom of heaven, the only book that you will read, I just gave it away, the only book that you'll read the kingdom of heaven in is what book? Matthew. That was a really tough question. That's the only book you're going to read the kingdom of heaven in. Why, why is that? Why do you suppose that in every other account it's the kingdom of God? Why have different, why have different phraseology? Gospel of Matthew. Matthew wrote... To and for the benefit of who? The Jews. Well, wouldn't the kingdom of God suffice? Wouldn't just calling the church the kingdom of God, wouldn't that have worked for the Jews? Why call it the kingdom of heaven? How does the Bible in the Old Testament refer and talk about the kingdom? It's going to come down from heaven. It's God's plan. It's the heavenly plan. This is a plan that doesn't, and, and what Matthew was trying to get them to see is that this is not a kingdom. And in fact, it's in John's account where it's recorded. Jesus says, my kingdom is not of this. It's not here. That's what the Jews needed to understand is that this plan had come from heaven, that this was a spiritual kingdom. Why did the Jews reject Jesus? Because they thought that he was coming to be an earthly king. Forget that. This is not an earthly king or an earthly kingdom. It's a spiritual kingdom. And so the only book written to Jews uses that phrase, the kingdom of heaven. Every other one is the kingdom of God. But throughout Jesus' work, throughout his ministry, it's all, he's always talking about the kingdom of God. He went to various cities preaching the gospel of the kingdom. Uh, over and over, he's going there, he says, I must preach the kingdom of God. That's what he went about doing on a daily basis. Matthew chapter 10, Luke chapter 9, Luke chapter 10, he sends out the 70. Then he sends out the apostles and the instructions that he gives to them is to go and to preach about, Matthew's account says kingdom of heaven. The other accounts say the kingdom of God. That's what they were to go and to preach. So not only his ministry, but even his apostles' ministry was to go about preaching about the kingdom. Talking about John the Baptist, he was least in the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God is greater than he, Matthew chapter 16. Here's a passage, if you're going to get in discussions with anybody about whether the kingdom was actually established in the, uh, in the first century, Jesus said, Surely I say to you, there's some standing here which will not taste of death till, the see, till they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Mark records it in Mark chapter 9 and verse 1 says, There's some standing here which will not taste of death till they see the kingdom of God come with power. When was his kingdom going to come? 
Well, sometime in the lifetime of those who were standing there. Otherwise, we've got some really old people around that are hidden in some caves that we're not aware of, still waiting for the kingdom. And if that were the case, what sense would that make of Jesus saying that? There's some people that are still alive who are going to see the kingdom. Was that true or not? It, it, what, was that going to come about or not? A uh, passage you need to know in Mark chapter 9 and verse 1. Uh, talking about children. And Jesus talked about, even when he's talking about children, he was talking about the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God, for such is the kingdom of God. In other places he says, don't, don't refuse them, but you need to be converted, become like them in order to enter the kingdom of God. Uh, so over and over, even when he's talking about little kids, he's talking about the kingdom. Oh, five minutes when he talked about those who loved riches. Do I have the passage up here that talks about those who trust it? Yeah, Mark chapter 10. Those not only who are rich, but those, not talking about rich people. He's talking about people who trust in riches. Those who love riches, he says, it's hard for those, for those people uh, to enter into the kingdom of heaven. In fact, he says it's easier for them to go through an eye of a needle uh, than to enter the kingdom of God. Talking about kids, he's talking about the kingdom. If he's talking about rich people, he's talking about the kingdom. Anybody, you know, what's the theme of Jesus' life? When he's instituting the Lord's Supper, he says, I'm not going to drink this uh, cup anew with you until I drink it with you uh, in my Father's kingdom. We know Matthew chapter 16, he said, I'm going to build my church. I'm going to give you the keys to the kingdom. John chapter 3 he says you need to be baptized in order to see or in order to enter uh, the kingdom of God. So over and over, you see that's his theme. It's the theme of the Sermon on the Mount. And I parallel here again the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God. Recognize that those are the same two things. But throughout the Sermon on the Mount, seek ye first the kingdom of God. That's the theme of his life, his ministry, theme of his preaching uh, throughout, uh, throughout the book. Do I have Mark, Matthew, I don't even have, Ma what did I do with Matthew 5? It's up the top. Did I, well, Matthew 5, 10, sorry. Yeah, I, my 5, 3, I guess I'd skip right over it. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. So over and over, uh, Jesus is talking about the kingdom. If you want to enter the kingdom, it's interesting. What do we usually talk about here? We usually talk about heaven. And we usually say people need to do the will of God to go to heaven. Is that true? Yes. Sure, that's true. And we make that application. And you can make that application from this verse. But what's this verse talking about? It's not talking about heaven. It's talking about the kingdom. It's talking about the church. Now, can you enter into, can you enter into heaven without entering into the kingdom? Can you, enter into heaven, can you enter heaven without entering the church? No, you can't. Uh, and so that's the primary teaching there. Uh, we just need to understand the application we make. Now, we're going to run out of time, but I said to start at this, I think the theme of the parables is the kingdom. Because when Jesus was asked in Matthew chapter 13, why are you speaking to them in parables? The answer he gives in verse 11 is because to you it has been given to know the mysteries of the what? Why are you teaching in parables? Because of the kingdom. Because I want you and I want everybody to understand uh, about the kingdom. And so throughout his teachings, uh, to what shall I liken the kingdom? And so obviously all of his parables are about the kingdom. And here's just a few uh, from Matthew's account where over and over, how did he introduce parables? And I like how Matthew says it. Another parable, another parable, another parable, again, 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 therefore, over and over. Here's all these parables and what does Jesus say? The kingdom of heaven is light. And if he introduced, I didn't count how many of these are, at least 10. If he introduced all of these parables, plus this one. Uh, if he introduced all of these parables by saying the kingdom of heaven is like, why did he teach in parables? Because he wanted people to grasp an understanding of the kingdom. There are a lot of people who want to uh, minimize the importance of the church. And want to minimize, obviously, which is the same, want to minimize, therefore, the importance of the kingdom. If Jesus taught in parables, and a third of his teachings are, are, are made up of parables, and he took that much time to tell us about his kingdom, if he took that much time to tell us about his church, 
how it, was to, how it was to be made up, how it was to function, how people were to behave in the church, shouldn't it have at least that much importance to us? Jesus spent a lot of time talking about his kingdom. I think, uh, well, this is the last slide. There's a lot of sub-themes to that kingdom. I'll let you see that. But if he spent this much time talking about the kingdom, not only should we spend a lot of private time studying, we ought to spend a lot of time in our classes talking about it. Because the kingdom and the church was that important to him. Acts chapter 20 and verse 28 tells us that Jesus did something to purchase the church. What was that? He shed his blood to purchase the church. He talked about it and then he gave his life so that what he had preached about and talked about could become a reality. And I think if it was that important to Jesus, the church needs to be that important, that important to us, and we need to spend some time studying it. Next week, we'll get into uh, the first parable, uh, the parable of the soul.